Welcome everyone to the Phantom Effect Podcast, a safe point during your day to hear and talk about anime, video games, comics, MMA, and a lot more. This podcast started as a way to show everyone to never be afraid to try something new, because at the end of the day, you never know what kind of impact a new idea or a new interest is going to have on you until you try. So welcome everyone to the Phantom Effect, and let's begin. We are here, episode 5 of the Phantom Effect. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We have a great guest for this episode. Oh, just on the delay, it was... Uh, wife went to the store and she got back and she had bought her two-year-old this um outside like water play set kind of thing so i had to very quickly dad put that together in a weird way and get that outside okay. so he can <laughs> run around and play with it no i i get it like family takes priority gotta get gotta jump in in dad mode sometimes oh yeah when the uh when the giant box gets dropped off it's like well someone's gonna build it <laughs> I don't know if they they explain necessarily in the uh, the application for fatherhood that uh, that assembly is required. Yeah, no, and I don't understand why kids' toys are made with just the weirdest things. Like, I don't know why so many kids' toys need screws to put it together. Like, it seems like clamps or other things have been invented that might make it a little easier. Like the thing I just put together, like we didn't even use two of the screws, but it's like yeah. Take a small screw and drop it down this really tiny hole and then somehow have a screwdriver small enough to get it in there and tighten it. I I just think about the fact that something like 60% of cars are put together with like clips that you just literally snap into place together and they're done. Like how can't they do that with children's toys? Yeah, you'd think technology would catch up children's toys, yet somehow it hasn't, technology hasn't reached it yet. It's like one of the largest industries on the planet, like billions and billions of dollars, and they're still safe. Uh, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, there's uh, the horror stories that you you end up <laughs> you end up coming up with when you're throwing together kids' I, toys. It's just, oh man. Oh yeah. I don't know if you have oh. kids or. Oh no, that's uh, that is a path that that me and my wife shall not be going down. Uh, yeah, <laughs> can't, we, we can't had that blame conversation you. Pretty early on, it's it's not our game. We've we've got plenty of like fur kids. I've got like six animals in the house, so that's oh that's nice. Not. Yeah, we we've reached the 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 stage with him where he's old enough to understand that people like have dogs as pets. Like they're not just things. Like people go out and buy them. So the past week has been like, yeah, like we'll be on a walk and I'll see a dog and he'll be like, Daddy, Mommy, I go buy a dog. Um, <laughs> right. I'm not sure where I take this part of the yeah, conversation. <laughs> That's Pandora's bot. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, he wants a small dog. Um, oh, of course. He's like, yeah, he's like, I like small dog, not big dog. I'm like, oh, buddy, why? <laughs> You're breaking my heart here. I've always been a, a big dog guy, but... You know, I, I was a big dog guy all of my life, and then I somehow went into Pomeranian, so... Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's not a choice that I would make again, but I, I can't say that I don't love these two. They're, they're kooky little animals, and they're forever pains in my butt but they're uh they're a good time yeah i feel like if i can ever convince the wife to to go ahead and just get the dog that i'll end up not wa- wa- not wanting a small dog and then wind up getting it and then i'll become obsessed with it and then you know sure enough now all of a sudden we have like 10 small dogs so oh, yeah hey, that, that's how it happened to me i had to draw the line at two because of course i had the two they they decided to choose me as the human that they liked in the house mm, yeah. so like they just <laughs> It's because they knew. No. They're like, oh, this guy didn't want small dogs, so we should probably go right to him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of how it, how it goes down. And then next thing you know, you've got a, a closet full of dog outfits. And it's, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's, it's that whole kit and caboodle. Do you, do you have the <laughs> Halloween costumes? or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, got a, no, I've got a pig, a lion. Um, I've got the little UPS guy where, like, the, he's got the package in front of him, so it looks like the dog's, like, carrying a package everywhere he runs. And, yeah. Oh, I've yeah, got yeah. Little yeah, that's bad. <laughs> Christmas ones too. I think that uh, for the guy dog got a uh, a Santa outfit for him, and then a little elf one for the for my for my little girl. It's uh it's terrible, and I'm ashamed of myself for it, but I love it all the same. <laughs> <laughs> but those, those are uh, those are some quality choices, though. Now, I think if you can, do you have if you do you have an Ewok one yet? That seems like that's probably an important one. See, I I've, I've thought about pulling the trigger on some of the Star Wars ones that they've got at like PetSmart and stuff like that, but. I, I, I kind of draw the line of draw, buying a $50 outfit for my dog. Like, that's, 
that's painful to me. Like I, yeah. I thought about getting the uh, I saw a Chewy Bandolier like dog harness that was on clearance there a couple months ago, and I was like, I was geeked. I'm like, I'm buying this thing. It's on clearance. Great. I picked it up, and it was still sixty five bucks. Yeesh. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't. I can, can't blame you on not, not pulling the trigger on that. Because it's, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, adorable as it would be, you, I you guess you would use it for, like, those two, three days, and then it's like, well, I'm going to put you in a box. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I'm all for tacky. I will lean hard to tack all day long. But, like, there there's there has to be, like, a, a cost-benefit analysis at some point. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, every time I buy certain toys for my kid, I'm always like, how much am I going to play with it, though? Even if it's a lot of money, uh, how much am I going to play with it compared to what he'll want to play with it? See, it's it's funny that you bring up the toy angle, because I think that was the driving line for me to say no to kids and yes to pets, because dog toys are cheap, and that means the money that's left over, I can still buy myself Lego and action figures, <laughs> and I don't have to take away from, from like, my enjoyment of the toys. <laughs> yeah, that's completely in the right uh mentality because certain kids toys are holy just like we didn't buy it for him but uh someone in my family bought him like a giant plane paw patrol thing and (laughs) we saw it at the store and it's like 65 bucks with tax and it's just this big empty plane that can shoot stuff and it makes like two sounds and it's like 65 bucks oh god yeah yeah it's 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 ridiculous and in some stuff you know will be nice like but he's not he's not old enough to like know how legos work so like we haven't bought like crazy lego sets because i'm like you'll destroy them and then i'll cry Um, getting about that point i mean you start rolling duplo box blocks i mean that's that's starting to get into that range but i mean oh yeah he's got a few but he's getting better but there are certain things where like i have uh i have gundams that i've built like on build kits so they're not obviously not really meant to be toys and now he sees those and uh there's an old anime called g gundam very slowly i'm collecting all the gundams from that show like the old toys like so they're it's hard to find like they're not crazy expensive it just takes a while to find everything and he sees them all now and he's like i play with that i'm like oh no no (laughs) no not that one Yeah, that would uh, that would break my my poor little fanboy heart. I uh, yeah, yeah. I just got out of a, a situation where I was cohabitating with somebody that had three three kids that were all in the like tween to teen range, Oof. and it still amazed me even like at that point how how easily everything gets broken. Oh yeah, they, and, and they why just is don't always sticky, always sticky. Yeah, no, it is no it. it... Everything is either sticky or he was eating Cheetos earlier, and so his hands are covered in Cheeto dust. <laughs> and normally, it's, it's 50-50 on whether or not he'll get done and then, like, tell us he needs to go wash his hands, or he'll just, like, think that no one's paying attention, and he just will, like, wipe them on whatever nearest object he can find. And, like, today it was his trampoline that we bought him. So we, here's, here's another perfect example of throwing money at kids' toys. So we were like, oh, you can't really go, we can't take him anywhere right now, like, places around. We were like, oh, we'll, we'll buy, like, stuff he can jump around with. So we bought him a kid's trampoline. Like, a, has, like, a bar, and he just jumps on it. Okay. 70 bucks. He uses it as a bed. <laughs> so... <laughs> He jumped on it, I think, for the first two days, and then now it's he's just like he's like yeah, I'm gonna go lay down and drink my milk on this trampoline. I'm like, oh, cool! I'm super glad that I got paid so yeah, I could get you a, a makeshift bed. <laughs> to be fair, though, like I can think to a Christmas back in the '80s where I got the the big old Ghostbusters playhouse, oh like, yeah, the giant thing, and I think my dad spent the majority of Christmas morning putting that thing together, and I spent the whole time. I'm just playing in the box, having a time of my life, and oh, yeah. didn't care at all about the toy for probably a good week or so. So yeah. I mean, I think we've all there. I think it just is one of those things where you have a little bit of a oh, so that's how it feels realization when you're on the dead end of it all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now I look back to like those years I did the same thing. I'm like, oh man, my parents must have felt like I was just a giant like little asshole. Like they spent <laughs> they spent all this money. Like I didn't care. <laughs> It's it's all a cycle. It's all a cycle. Oh yeah. I mean, he's you know he's getting better with it, but Christmas is still like after the first three or four gifts that he opens, he's like, "What do you mean I have to open more? Can I just play with the toys that I have now? Like, why do I need to open more? I have what I want." <laughs> like, no, there's so exactly. much more to open, bud. He's like, "No, no, I'm good." They start getting exhausted. It's uh, I think it gets more fun when they start getting to like the eight or nine. That way, you start pulling pranks on them with Christmas presents, and that's that's oh, yeah. an enjoyable part of uh, of adulting. Oh yeah. When I can mess with him a little bit more and not have him like freak out or cause permanent psychological damage, you know that'll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, the, the permanent psychological damage part. That's yeah. That's a uh, that's a caveat that has to be considered, though, isn't it? He's yeah. He's very weird when it comes to like certain stuff. Like he gets freaked out by the weirdest things, and then we'll watch like a super gory horror zombie movie and just unaffected, just nothing. No, no. He's just like, cool. That person's dying from a zombie, right, Dad? I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah. That's. That's what's happening. I don't know how I yeah. feel about that. But I, I've done my job, though. He he knows more DC and Marvel than, than anything else. So I'm doing my yeah, job slowly. Part. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting... I'm corrupting him early on so he doesn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's what I've done with my little sisters. I've got a, a 10-year-old little sister and every every get holiday, every, every birthday, she's getting DC, Marvel stuff, and all that kind of deal. You gotta you gotta, you gotta taint them at, at an early age. Go ahead and make sure they, they catch an interest in it. Oh, then, yeah. Then at that point, then they just run. Oh, yeah. And so, some stuff will be fun with him. Like, uh, I'm sure we'll get into it. Back when I was doing cosplay stuff, there's, like, I mean, he's not old enough yet. He'll, he'll tear whatever I try to, to do with him, but there's definitely future plans down the road to have him, you know, dress up as, like, little mini cosplay versions of other people. See, I, I love that, and that's something that, in all the years that I've been cosplay photography, that I've always, like, had a big admiration for, is, like, the parents who get their kids involved, and the kids who also, like, dive headlong into it as well. Uh, there is a family that I, I used to see all the time at uh, Grand Rapids Comic Con that all used to do different versions of the Joker. Oh, and nice. at first it was the mom, the dad, and a baby. And then it was mom, dad, and that kid, like, as, like, a five- or six-year-old, and then a baby brother. And then there was a, you know, the, it ended up at one point there was three kids, them, and then a couple of their cousins that got into it, too, and they were all doing different versions over and it was really cool to see it was a neat little bonding thing oh yeah it it's, a, i feel like that's it's, it's a good like it, it, it's fun to do because they can pick something that they at that age are really into and kind of spend time putting their own little kid twist on it yeah i know enough where i can make some stuff for him oh yeah and then i mean beyond that the community is so broad nowadays that there's anything that you do need i mean between commissioners 3d printers and just general people that love to do crazy projects. You throw anything together with just one post on the onto a page, getting interest, just run with it from there. Oh yeah, and especially with three D printers, some of the stuff that you see people three D printing is is uh, pretty crazy. I mean, like they're. I want to get one eventually just because some of the things you can do with those are pretty sweet. And they're getting insanely affordable. Yeah. And I think that's, I think when they first came out, they were, I think like the cheapest model was like $500. And I know a buddy of mine just got one on sale a couple months ago for like two, two thirty, two fifty. which nice. for a, like, I think, I think it was like a, a low to mid range 3d printer kind of in that, uh, that area, but yeah, 200 bucks for, uh, even like two, 300 bucks for a good 3d printer. I mean, you can't really you know, knock that. And it's probably just going to keep going down as it becomes like more standard to have that kind of. Yeah. And I mean, I, I take a look at it like, uh, like laser printers, laser printers when they first came out, you were talking two, three, $5,000 for a home unit, not even something commercial. And now we're at a point where you can run into Walmart and can grab a professional grade laser printer that's going to print thousands of pages on a single cartridge for 150 bucks. Oh yeah, and it's been 15 years since that technology has started kind of really ramping up, and now here it is. We're still at the infancy of 3D printing, and you can walk into Micro Center and you can get a little tiny three inch by three inch print bed, you know, something tiny to play with for 150 bucks. But like you said, you can find mid range machines with a decent sized print bed that you can continue to add on to it modularized because these are all open source machines for 150 200 bucks heck yeah oh yeah like i'm glad i've already i planted the the seeds a long time ago that when me and the wife do get like a a new house that i was like yeah like, i want to get a 3d printer because i can like not only print nerdier things but i was like i can print like stuff for the house and like stuff for you and she's like how much i was like oh you know like 300 bucks oh that's not that bad all right i'm in like score Fair. I don't have to worry about it. Go. It's already done. Cash in. Like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thankfully my wife is is all in on a on a nerd cave for me. Like she's literally telling me to take our spare bedroom and pull it apart for a a little photo studio for me. So I'm uh I, I'm pretty set on that. Well, that'll be nice. I, yeah. I mine's more like she doesn't care how much stuff I have. It's just like she just wants it 
you know, she's going to have her vision. It's just like, yeah, there's, you know, whether it's the basement or a separate room, it's going to be, that's yours. Put all your stuff in there. Put your computer in there, you know, soundproof it for podcasting. She's like, yeah, that's all you. You can do whatever you want. So when we do get a space, um, which I think we're looking at, like, in the winter, we're going to try to get a house. But hey, it's uh, it's looking like it may end up being a good market for you. So, yeah, we had... Um, we had tried. We had looked before when I was living in Michigan, and we had did it in the summer. And then we just kind of realized that the winter was, you know, because people hate moving in general, but people especially hate moving in the winter because then you have to trot through snow and, and ice. We were like, if we can save like five grand on a house just because it's the winter, I'm all for it. And yeah, with oh, that, yeah. especially with the, yeah, like you said, like the market today, it's it hasn't crashed yet, but it's pretty much only a matter of time. Oh yeah. It's uh, it, it's a weird time right now. It, I, I officially decided this is the darkest timeline, and Abed was right. Yeah, whatever, whichever Flash went back in Flashpoint. But Darren, uh, how is it going today, sir? You know, I, I can't complain after uh, about two months of lock-in, just kind of hanging out, keeping it easy. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's been fun. I, those of you who have kept up with the episode so far, yes, still we are still under lockdown. We are so. We started with episode one under lockdown, and we are episode five, and we are still under still under lockdown. Uh, this is just reality now. We accept it. Yeah, going to stores with masks and seeing parks completely empty on sunny days, and it's yeah, it's it's a weird reality that we're now being placed into. But you got you got to make the most of it. Have fun when you can. Exactly. And out of lemonade or lemonade lemons back and forth, whichever. Yeah, well, I mean, depending, I mean, in today's world, it's who touched the lemons, and how long has it been since you touched them, and who else have touched the lemons, and, you know, how long, <laughs> so. Oh, man, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a mess, it's yeah. a mess. Yeah, yeah, it is. Now, I, I know for, to kind of g- give everyone a little background, uh, you do a lot of different photography, but you've done a lot of different cosplay photography, I, I know you've kind of done some from family cata- uh, photography as well, I know you have a, a website we'll, we'll get into that you're launching as well and kind of some things around the Metro Detroit area, play D&D, like just to kind of give everybody kind of a, a brief little uh, history and kind of some of the things that you've done, um, and which is which is a lot. And I, I feel like that's that's pretty interesting. You know, would you say there was anything specific? Like, you, I feel like a lot of times maybe someone kind of they dial into maybe one aspect of photography. And obviously, in your case, you've you've done multiple different types. Is there, is there a reason you kind of have, have done so many things like that you didn't want to just stick to one thing or kind of how did that kind of play out for you? So my photography journey has been really interesting out of all the things that I've done because it started back in 2004 was the first time that I really started shooting and that was because a friend of mine worked for a car magazine and needed somebody to snap a couple shots for something that was going to go up on their website, which they just launched. And it was this crazy weird thing where I got handed a camera and here you go and off I went. I didn't really do much with it outside of taking pictures of cars for the better part of a decade and then a friend of mine Jana Lewis uh, got a hold of me and invited me to start working with her and uh, her friend Brad and uh, Jackie, who you just had on uh, previously, uh, joining a group called Skeletons in Space Suit. And uh, they are a, a web blog uh, featured on Facebook. And they do all sorts of crazy things where they visit out doing hallway photos of folks at conventions. And I did nothing but cosplay and convention photography from 2014 to 2018. I, absolutely nothing. That's all I shot. That was it. Hmm. And uh, just in the last few years, I decided I kind of wanted to branch out and see what else kind of tickled my creative fancy. And I realized, one, I can actually make some money with this. So I quit my big day job and started doing nothing but photography in uh, 2017 and been doing family photos along with convention stuff and then fell into wedding stuff because I guess that goes hand in hand with shooting family photos and that led me into doing some branding stuff because apparently wedding industries are all intertwined and people buy lots of stuff and it's really expensive and it, it all works out together and it's just been this weird, weird mix but it all it almost always circles right back into the cosplay and fandom communities because that's what I realize that even with everything else that I'm doing and everything else that I love so much fun and helps keep me and my family fed, um, cosplay and fandom stuff is just fun. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, 
it's it's so it's so little stress when I'm actually behind the camera and snapping photos and like I work with Jackie who you had on here previously and she's a she's an awesome cosplayer has fantastic ideas and every time her and I work together it's just such a blast and there's no stress to it and I'll just all of a sudden realize like the hour and a half slot that we had scheduled out to do this shoot has all of a sudden turned into three hours and it's midnight and we have to work in the morning and what do we do now? Right. <laughs> I definitely remember sessions like that. People probably have remembered from previous episodes. I used to be a, a, a pretty heavily cosplayer in the, the Midwest area. Uh, primarily just did like Greed from Fulman Alchemist and Red Hood. I've since hung up uh, the helmet, so to speak. Cons just got too expensive for me. Uh, but it, it brings up, you kind of brought up a, a couple of good points. And like, like you said, like, you know, Jay Volpix, yeah, Jackie has a lot of different ideas. Uh, as a cosplay photographer, when you're at a con, is it is it easier when a cosplayer comes to you with um, ideas or poses? Or do you like to also, like, suggest things that you think would look, like, really cool for what they're cosplaying? So when I schedule stuff out for, for conventions, I want to invest a little bit of my time in the cosplayer's creation. So if I get booked for a, for a thing, I'm going to go ahead and figure out what it is that you're cosplaying so I can, A, watch an episode or two of the manga or anime or whatever the case may be that you're wanting, that you're doing your character out of. And I'm going to scan through some stuff that's out on the internet so I at least have some reference because it's not easy getting in front of the camera. And a cosplayer can have a million and a half pose ideas, uh, routines, quotes, everything in their head. But we've all seen it on like a cosplay competition stage where the nerves get the best of them and they've got everything planned out to a T. But they zoom across that stage at a thousand miles a second. And the same thing happens in a, in a photo shoot. I've seen cosplayers that have $3,000 built into a cosplay that have completely frozen because they just can't think of anything in the moment. So I like to come with my own thing. That way I can kind of nudge the process along. Okay, so kind of a, a good mixture. Like, it's, it's helpful if they have a few ideas, but if someone were to, like you said, kind of freeze up uh, a little bit, at least yourself would have, like, a few ideas to where they're not, you know, like, wasting their, you know, their full photo shoot or something. Exactly. Uh, is it is it easier to shoot uh, if you're at a convention? Like, is, is, is outside versus outside drastically different, or do you kind of approach it similar? Honestly, it really depends on the con, um, because there are places like Colossal Con. You can go to Colossal Con and find a million and a half spots to shoot indoors that have great lighting, good atmosphere, and you don't have to do a single thing to them. But then at something like YumaCon, you have to kind of balance it between, is there a space that I can get to that's not going to be crowded, or am I stuck outside in the freezing cold? And uh, do you have, you mentioned conventions, is there is there a specific con that, like, when you know you're going to that convention, that you're just going to have, like, some of your best photo shoots? Is there, like, just, is there, is there that kind of con? There are two that hold my heart. Uh, YumaCon is, is my home con that kind of started my, my whole journey with everything, but and just as far as the types of photos and the quality of the cosplay that I find, I uh, Colossal Con Prime is just amazing. Is there now? Is there something about? I know you said Yuma Con was kind of the home con. Is there something about Colossal Con that just makes it really special for uh, photography? So one is just the environment. You have water features. You've got the the rock climbs and everything around the actual pool area. You got the pool area itself. You've got this great big forest area behind the, the parking area. You've got the bungalows, the buildings themselves. It's just, there's a lot of stuff that goes all in, into it, but then the cosplayers themselves usually have gone ahead and tailored their cosplay to a specific area that they have in mind for this photo set. So it ends up being this really cool collaborative deal where they have a vision and I'm not so much coming up with everything. I'm helping them kind of create this this idea that they have in their head. Okay. And what's the the process like once you get done with like a photo shoot, uh, what's kind of like the process for not just like time, but like overall, like, so you get, you have all the pictures. What's kind of like the, the process from getting the raw files and like getting it back to the cosplayer? So I do my best to turn around everything within 10 days. So I will have a gallery and color corrected within 10 days where you then can select out of based on the packages because I do different deals 
depending on kind of what we're looking at. But from there, you'll have a gallery of, say, 25, 30 photos, and then you'll be able to select your 3, 5, 10, however, that you want to fully edit. And then that turnaround process, depending on how intense the edits need to be, can be another week or so. Okay. And is, is it typical to just get like someone asking for like just a, like a normal photo editing, you know, like working on like, you know, ex- different exposures and um, things like that. Or do you, do you also have certain cosplayers that like come to you and they want you to do like Photoshop type stuff to the photos? So I personally, I do a lot of practice. Um, so I don't get a lot of re- uh, requests for, for Photoshop work. Um, but what I do get requests for is, um, Hey, I broke my, my wing and it's epoxied right now. Can you edit that part of the wing out to correct it? Which it's not always a, ton- a laborious process or a lengthy process, but sometimes you're dealing with different types of media, different types of surfaces. And obviously with the high resolution photos we got nowadays, it, it can take a little while to get something to look like it's not edited out when you're changing out a piece of tape or uh, some glue that shouldn't be someplace and, you know, little things like that. But right. I, I try not to do anything too intensive just because, honestly, the cosplayers put in all the work. I want, I want that to be the post. Back when I, had co- when I was cosplaying, I had a few cosplayers that I knew that whenever they did post photos from a con, you know, some posted just simple ones, and I had ones where they went back in and did, like, crazy Photoshop edits, had all these crazy things going on. And- oh, I, I seriously respect the the photographers that do that kind of stuff, but unfortunately, one, it's it's a little out, outside of my realm of ability, I'll, I'll straight up be honest with that, but for two, I just, it's it's not a process that I enjoy with uh, with photography. Photoshop is a very powerful tool, and it's great, and I, I love everything it does, but it just, I don't have the, I don't have the patience. The, the ADD gets the best of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know exactly what you mean. It's, sometimes it becomes, is, you know, is, is the extra time you're putting into something worth it at the end of you banging your head against the wall repeatedly to, to make something happen? Or should you just kind of like take the natural photo that you have, do some basic enhancements and kind of call it a day? Yeah, and that right there hit the nail on the head. Uh, because that's that's been the driving force behind me learning what I've learned with with practical effects with doing things like uh, like handheld fireballs and not you know I do sparkle effects I do smoke bombs uh, colored smoke flares all sorts of stuff like that and it, it's amazing the things that you can come up with and you can create with a little bit of research and working within the realms of safety to come up with really really cool photo ideas that don't involve you spending 36 hours with a clone stamp in the burn tool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that burn tool. <laughs> uh, I know from experience, uh, smoke bombs can be good and bad, uh, depending on, on how they're used. Uh, ha- have the experiences for you been generally good, or do you have any of like those horror stories of smoke bombs? The, uh, the closest I've come to a horror story with a smoke bomb was a photo shoot in a abandoned building with a cosplayer. Um, which is already sketchy, <laughs> which, by the way, kids, like, don't trespass, like, be safe, like, don't, don't do silly things, use me as a cautionary tale, um, and we lit off smoke bomb in a, in what we thought it was going to be a relatively small cloud of smoke, because it was just a little tiny smoke bomb, but it was one of those ripcord ones, and we weren't expecting it to go off for, like, a minute and a half, and we filled the small room that we were in, and didn't know how to get out of it, Ooh. with black smoke, <laughs> oh, that just, and there were no windows, that, that we could pop open or anything, and it was probably the better part of, like, 15 minutes of me and my friend Rachel, like, banging around in this little room trying to find a tiny little door to squeeze out of, and, yeah, just always make sure you've got that alert. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, cautionary tale for everyone out there, don't open up a smoke bomb in a small room unless you know where the door is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always know where your exits are. They aren't hitting on planes. Like they, they point them out for a reason. I guess. <laughs> like you lose those things. Wow. Yeah. That that's uh that's pretty crazy. I I haven't had an experience like that, but we have had weird ones where we've lit off pink and blue smoke bombs, and then we've had people like find us five minutes later. What are you doing? And why are you here? And why are you lighting <laughs> off smoke bombs? And why are all of you dressed really weird? What is going on? You know, it it does draw quite a bit of attention when you're in a public space, doesn't it? Yeah, a, a little bit. I, I always think back, um, you had mentioned Yumicon earlier, and that was definitely one of the first, I think, bigger conventions that I had cosplayed at, but I, 
I think one of my favorite things was when you were taking the uh, the tram between the two buildings, and it would make the stops at like the casino or uh, Joe Lewis, mm-hmm. and uh, the doors would open, and you know to, to put it in air quotes, so to speak, on an audio podcast, uh, the normies that would be like at the casino waiting to get on the tram to like head back to where their cars were parked. And then the doors would open and it's just three full cars of people in, <laughs> in God's place. If the look on their face is just, oh, I'm going to wait for the next one. And you know, in your head that there is no next one. That's not going to have this anytime it's soon. It's going to be a constant parade of weaves and oddities. And it's all fantastic. And yeah, <laughs> the people mover is always a treat. It, yeah, it, it was always just such a fun interaction watching like just <laughs> uh, some of the things that you see on the, the trams is always very interesting to le- to safely leave it at that and not uh, <laughs> go into too much crazy detail. Um, <laughs> for you, for the, the length of time you've been doing cosplay photography, which I think you said 2014, you know, roughly like six, six plus years. Um, might be kind of hard to, to, to pick point, but is there like a highlight moment for you that you've had so far doing cosplay photography? I, I think one of the, uh, the cool moments for me that stands out was getting to meet, uh, Kelly Kirsten on, on kind of a, a random lark at Yomacon. Are you, are you familiar with who she is? I am not. So she is actually a, a pretty huge deal in the Steven Universe uh, cosplay community. Um, she plays uh, Lepi's and she does a white diamond that is absolutely killer. Um, she was a uh, contestant for Miss Michigan in 2013. Oh, wow. Um, she has a fantastic blog. She's a great person. She just got engaged to love of her life, Claude, is like awesome, awesome person. And I've always admired her airbrush and body painting work because it's just stellar. Um, but just her general like interactions with her community have always been awesome. And through a weird series of events, I found out that she's related to a friend of mine. So I was able to connect with her and do a photo shoot kind of on, on a whim with her and her whole little collection of uh, Steven Universe gems. And it was it was a cool little thing. And it was uh, I was starstruck the whole time. It was like my first time having a brush with anybody that was, uh, for lack of a better word, cost famous, I guess. Was, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Is, I, is that I, a tacky I, phrase nowadays? I don't, I don't know. Is there but, another uh, word though? I don't. I think. I think yeah, you. Yeah, because I've heard that a ton. Like, yeah, like cos cos famous or cosplay famous. Because yeah, I don't know if there's really like a term for uh, when you like, made it big. Yeah, and I mean, she she has so many other things that that she's known for. But I mean, that's still one of the, that's just one of the things that kind of stands out. But I just I remember the whole time being like, oh my god, I'm I'm never gonna have this opportunity again. This is kind of <laughs> cool. <laughs> I, uh, I I've only had one interaction where I I didn't know who the person was when I was at a convention and I ended up like hanging out with a guy and like people like I kept watching people as me and this guy like and a few other people were just like going around the con like running up and like kind of like you like stargazing after this guy and like fawning over it and then like by default of course taking pictures of the rest of us and like I found out my buddy later he was like yeah this dude's like uh he was like a Jojo cosplayer and mm. my buddy was like yeah he's like like one of the most well-known Jojo cosplayers in the Midwest like dude's a huge deal <laughs> and I was like oh oh okay I was like all right we've just been hanging out with him for like the past five hours like okay um which is yeah but like you said it's sometimes you know and it's there are times like you just I think that it goes to a good point, like you said, with how how good of a person she is, like with not just her fans, but like in general. And same for this guy, you know, he could he could have a huge ego on him and have been like a you know a huge tool. And but you know, again, like nice guy. I mean, there's there's always going to be a few. I'm sure you've had interactions with interesting cosplayers, for lack of a better term. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean every bad apple or every every bunch is going to have its, its bad apples, and, and thankfully I I can say that the negative interactions that I've had have been few and far between because honestly this community is kind of fantastic, and then that's what keeps bringing me back to it every time that I say like oh I'm I'm at a point where I'm I'm too old for cons I shouldn't be going to it all the time <laughs> I've got other I've got other vacations that I should be going on this that the other. I, I stop and I think, and it's like I could I could go and I could spend the same money. Like I I would honestly rather shoot and work with cosplayers all day long versus some of the interactions that I've had with like the the fashion and art folks that I that I work oh, with. Geez. <laughs> <laughs> the the art community is a really thing, and the, and the personalities there are just as dynamic as they are in the uh, the convention and the fandom world, uh, which is a, a whole other. Um, 
conversation. But oh, it's, yeah. Uh, and it's, I have... it's a cool thing, and, and it's one of those things where I kind of come back to realize that like, I can, even as I continue to get older, I can still continue to prioritize having fun at conventions because, I mean, it is fun. And, you know, when you get past some of the stupid drama that goes on, they're, they're, uh, they're relatively wholesome. They're, they're a, a, a pretty good weekend if you're looking for something on a budget. Because, I mean, in the realm of vacations you can take, it's cheaper to go to Colossal Con for a weekend than it is to, you know, do an all-inclusive in Mexico. Oh, yeah. And and you'll probably drink just as much. Well, yeah. (laughs) You you, you definitely will. (laughs) That is is definitely true. I've had definitely some uh, some fun interactions and... I think to your point, it's sometimes it's those are the those are the best for, you know memories. You know, thinking back to those three in the morning walks in down you know in downtown Chicago, and, you know you're just trying to make your way to like a twenty four hour diner. Should you be sleeping? Probably. Are you getting up in seven hours, throwing back on tons of cosplay stuff, and walking for twenty hours? Yes. Do you care? Not really. Being being dead tired and miserable can wait for Monday. Yeah, sleep can wait for a while. I'm, you know, supposed to be, you know, quote working unquote. Um, <laughs> uh, but you, you brought up a, a really good point, and I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned it with the kind of just the atmosphere of uh, of conventions. And you know, if if this is if you're listening to this right now, and this is your first episode of of the Phantom Effect, um, you're maybe wondering why I'm actually doing this. If it's not your first uh, listen, you kind of already have an, an idea, so I'll keep it kind of short, but. Um, I have, I've been in a lot of different things, you know, I've, I've done cosplay, I did MMA for five years, I, uh, did bowling, I did, you know, things all over the, I know, comics, anime, like, I'm all over the spectrum in a wide, you know, wide variety of things, and, you know, there was some stuff I think you kind of grow up with being into, you know, I remember playing video games with my dad, I think we all kind of have that one thing that maybe started us off, but for me, if it wasn't for certain people, I would never would have gotten into so many of the things that had uh, massive impacts on my life, and so I realized that I wanted to try to give back to, to everybody else while also showcasing the people who make all these things possible, so if this is your first episode, you know, definitely uh, keep tuning in, but that's the idea uh, behind the fan Effect, just to help give back to everyone who makes our fandoms like actually fun because if it wasn't for photographers like yourself that you know gave cosplayers like uh, a good interaction when they did uh photo shoots you know that person might never be willing to do a photo shoot again if their first time doing it they got some photographer who was just like yeah here's your picture now you know get out of my face uh you can you can preach on that over and over (laughs) that's 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 something that on the photographer side of the community, what you just described is something that, that a lot of us talk about a problem. Um, because it's not hard to go run to, to Wally World to grab a Canon T5i for $449 to lend battery in a bag and slap yourself together a Wix page and call yourself a photographer. Right. And God love them. Some people, they're going to do it. They're going to pick up that camera and they're going to run with it. And they're going to be talented. They're going to be great. They're going to be fantastic. And, you know, they're going to become Pierre McKinnon someday. Um, but by and large, there's going to end up being negative and interactions with that people are going to get subpar photos people are going to pay their hard-earned money for something and then they're never going to want to do it and that's that's not good for anybody like that's that ruins a con experience maybe they're not going to go to that con again maybe they're going to fall out of love with that fandom and next thing you know they're a middle-aged office drone (laughs) and hating life and nobody wants to end up like that no no and so hopefully you know long-term goal I can use this as a as a platform to to help others maybe refine a certain fandom or to encourage others to try uh, try one that they haven't tried before. Um, because you know, if it, like I said, if it wasn't for certain things happening, I never would have done a lot of things. Uh, it, do I pay for some of it now? Yeah, you know, I'm I have giant soreness all over from tearing tons of things doing MMA for five years, but uh, you know, definitely at the end of the day, it was totally worth it. You know, I've I've been able to spar. If you know world champion Muay Thai fighters, and it's uh, same thing with conventions. You know, I've been able to meet amazing people, and it's so. It's if it wasn't for uh, a buddy of mine, you know, if it wasn't for uh, Mark, yeah. way way back in the day, the first convention I ever cosplayed at Motor City Comic Con, he wanted to go really bad. He didn't have anybody he wanted to go. He wanted to cosplay as Deathstroke. Uh, there was an actor who was on the first season of Arrow that was going to be there, and he like twisted me like bugged me about it for a while to just buy a green arrow uh suit like a cosplay suit 
and go with him and cosplay as Green Arrow and Deathstroke and, and meet this guy. And that was the first experience I had. And if it wasn't for him kind of twisting my arm a little bit, I never would have had the vast multitude of experiences I've had since then being able to meet, um, I've met like, uh, three of the four hobbits from Lord of the Rings. I've met Gimli, you know, and so it's, it's just, you know, like I said, it's, it's those, it's those memories. So like, I think to your point, it's, you know, if you do you know, though that, that, that bad experience early on can really like stop you from having just uh, those memories that are going to last you a lifetime just because that one person kind of, kind of ruined it for you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And it's, it's those sour, sour experience that people will remember because I mean, I can, I can think of 10 or 15, like highlight moment of my con going career, but then at the same note, I could probably go ahead and list off the same number of interesting things that could be perceived as negative. But I mean, it's, it's all about perceptive and perception and interaction and uh, ultimately picking your battles with the whole thing because it's it's all a matter of I want to call it maybe leveraging expectations is that a, is that a good way to kind of talk about like going into a con I, for the first time maybe I, I think like, so because yeah. I, I think I think it, it's it, I think it, it goes for whichever end of the spectrum you're on whether you're crazy hyping it up and cosplaying and you're expecting all these things or if you're not cosplaying and you think it's going to suck, I think you have to just kind of go into it with an open mind just to, to have fun. Because you can have, you know, interactions with that could, that can make a con bad. You know, if, if you're going with the sole purpose of like, oh, I just, I, there's a few people I want to meet, the lo- those lines can get crazy long. You know, I've had conventions where I wasted, now I wouldn't say wasted, that might be the wrong word, but that I spent three, you know, three hours in line meeting a person and that, that experience was awesome. But if you didn't know that going into the convention that you were going to wait in line for three hours. So like if it was your first convention and you wanted to meet this actor or this voice actor, or, you know, something that was going to be there and you just thought, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go in, I'm going to get in line. I'll, I'll meet them. And then I'll, you know, I'll see what this convention actually is. And then you're in that line for three plus hours just standing. And then you just want to go home. Like, so I think, yeah, to your point, not only do you have to kind of temper your expectations, I think you have to, you know, either talk to people that have gone or, you know, perhaps go on their Facebook page and ask, ask the question of like, Hey, I want to do this. How long does that kind of typically take uh, to go into it knowing that? Cause I think if you go into it, not knowing certain things like that could ruin the experience. Yeah, no, you, I mean, you raise a very good point with that because there, there are them that people talk about with like Yamatan quote unquote line con because of how long it takes to get your badge on pre-reg and the waiting for the elevators and everything else. So I, I think there's, there's a certain amount of, of patience that you have to go into a con with, but then I think you also have to kind of go into it with the idea of you are, you are, you might be spending or, you know, burning three hours in line to a voice actor that you really want to meet. But then when you stop and think about you're standing three hours in line with a group of people that all want the same exact person. Like, you guys are all there for a reason. You guys all have a shared interest. So you have those opportunities to have really cool conversation. And you can meet other people that have really cool interests. And you can make lifelong friends, which is, the, like, the best thing in, in the world to me about convention. Like, people can talk all the junk they want about all the weird stuff and all the drama and everything else. But the the girl that signed the witness for, for my wedding certificate, like, was, was a girl that I met at a convention. Like, I had, actually, all the people that were at my wedding showing up for my side were people that I met at convention. And, and I wouldn't change that for the world. They're, they're a great one, and I have to love it. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think the... I, I definitely have had numerous examples of that, and still one of my best friends to this date is a guy that um, I'm not. I don't know if it's a story that uh, man. I'll, I'll embarrass myself, I guess, for for my fans out there. Um, Do it. <laughs> uh, I was I was in line with another friend who I can't name. The speed dating for Yumacon because the the friend of mine wanted to go and didn't want to stand in line alone. I was like, okay, oh. all right, whatever. Like I'll, I'll you know I'll do it with you. And then that friend ended up bailing after about an hour waiting in line. And I was like, well, I'm already, I've already waited in line an hour and a half. I'm, I'm doing this thing. So <laughs> <laughs> spoiler, I ended, yeah, spoiler, I ended up not doing it. But while I was waiting in line, <laughs> while I was waiting in line, there was two guys in front of me that were talking about wrestling. And I'm a huge uh, wrestling fan. Right now, it kind of sucks because they record in front of an empty audience and it's really weird. But I um, was super into wrestling and I just randomly kind of interjected into the conversation because they were mentioning like a certain wrestler I really liked. And then uh, turns out one of the guys was like an indie wrestler at the time. And he was like, yeah, come to my show next week, man. Like 
I ended up hanging out with those guys the rest of the day, met up with one of the guys the next day, hung out with him the whole day. Me and that guy still talk to this day all the time. And he's actually one of the guys that I started the pop look page with. Uh, nice. So, yeah, to your point, I think it's, you know, it's again, like, yeah, you can spend all day waiting in line, but all of a sudden, like, you, you get so bored waiting that line, you're just like, all right, screw it. I'm going to talk to these five people around me because I'm not standing in this line for, you know, another 20 minutes of dead silence. And you meet all those people. And I think it's, uh, some of it's working up the nerves to actually, like, put yourself out there and have that conversation because no one, no one wants to try and make friends as a grown adult. And it, it's weird putting yourself out there and, and being vulnerable. But it's, uh, it's cool when you, uh, when you do make those connections stuff kind of kind of does go right on there and sometimes you you just make that friend for the con and you have somebody that you, you hang out with for that couple of days it's it's done but then there's also people that you meet year after year after year at that same con even if it's out of state out of city out of whatever it's a cool little thing and i'm and i'm glad that i got involved in it as uh as random as it was oh yeah it, it was it was definitely uh definitely fun it's definitely a great experience uh for do you stick, so for cosplayers out there or for people that are out there thinking of they're kind of listening to this, um, for you yourself, like, so for your own photography, do you stick to just Midwest cons? Uh, yeah, I stick primarily to Midwest. Um, I range as far as Chicago, as far east as uh, uh, Colossal East. And then uh, I have gone down to a couple of cons in the far south. Like, I've done Dragon Con a couple of times. But I mostly stick around the Midwest. Uh, Grand Rapids Comic Con, Motor City Comic Con. Yelma, uh, Glass City and Midwest when they were a thing. Okay, okay. And um, so I know you're, you're um, so for everyone out there, the, the link will obviously be posted, but I know your Instagram is slash Darren James Photography. Is that where, like, is that where people can go to, to book you? Or how do you typically kind of book for a convention for everyone out there? So I try to do word of mouth advertising. So I'll usually reach out to the Facebook group for the upcoming convention uh, anywhere between like two to three months before everything and start putting out the word that I'm on my way once I have everything confirmed. Um, people are welcome to reach out to me on the, the Instagram page. It's a little empty right now. Um, so with all of this COVID stuff, I had wiped my Instagram completely clear, like deleted everything at the end of February, beginning of March. And I had like scheduled and then I had a couple of cons that were coming up and I had other stuff that was all supposed to happen. And then the stay at home order went to peace, went to peace. Yeah. So like the content's a little sparse. I've got plenty of stuff under my tag work, so there's still plenty of stuff there, but I do update like the events that I'm heading to. And uh, I do usually keep my stories pretty, pretty current with anything that I've got going on for projects and that kind of thing there. Okay. So make sure um, those of you listening do definitely go to uh, the link for the Instagram when it's posted. And if you're a uh, Midwest cosplayer, uh, make sure you stick to that. And I, I don't know, you know, here's my my terrible uh, transition piece, but uh, <laughs> did did kind of you know the creativity of doing uh, cosplay for Tiger that been going over? I know you would you would mention this to me, and um, we talked about earlier, but that uh, the Detroit uh, ETC uh, website that you're uh, working on right now what you know for, for everyone out there can you want to give everyone kind of like a, an explanation of what that is and then you know what did like what kind of made you think of like this is something i want to do because obviously making a website and it is as in depth and as great as 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 an endeavor is that you want to make it like that's definitely no easy task so the, the thing that really drove me to it and maybe decide to really put something together that's that's so centered on detroit and away from a lot of the the stuff that a lot of my creative work has been focused on is uh, I, I grew up in the city and I've seen a lot of things come and go, which honestly like makes me sound like, <laughs> old as all get out. But it's it's made me kind of want to showcase more of what Detroit actually is. Um, the city's gone under a major transformation in the last 10 years. And when when people that have never been come to an event like Yomacom, which is probably the best example that I can give since it's still right in the heart of downtown Detroit, they're shocked. Um, I worked with two cosplayers from out of state uh, this past year, and they were both completely blown away as they had never gone to Detroit before in their lives. And they were like, we were expecting it to be a, all kinds of ghetto, and like we were scared. And now like it's nicer than parts of Chicago. This is insane. I had the thought in my head of, like, I want to try and be able to give that kind of impression to people that don't have the money to get. I want to showcase the things that are happening, the people that are creating, the the stuff that connects all of really cool communities that we have within the city of Detroit. Like, we're the home and birthplace of techno. 
um, are auto called second to none. Um, a lot of the people that are involved with creating a lot of the geekery and fandom that we're here for, they're, they're from the Motor City and they draw a lot of inspiration from it. And I just want to be able to go ahead and put together a platform that kind of lets me curate my experience as somebody that's grown up in very different versions of the city over the years and kind of broadcast it to a larger audience so they know we're kind of more than, you know, bandos and Eminem's mom's spaghetti. <laughs> Yeah, there, there is definitely a stigma. I had definitely the same experiences. Cosplayers and I went to different places where they found out where I was from and now moving to Wisconsin, uh, which is where I am now and having people like at work or people that you meet that are like, oh, you grew up in the Detroit area, like that kind of sucks. And it's like, no, like it's no, it's better than, you know, not only is it better than what you think, like I prefer Detroit, you know, Detroit was a great place to, to go to. And uh, I think it's, it's really admirable what you're doing just because I think, like you said, there's the stigma is still out there and the city has done so much to improve over the last five years that almost nobody knows if you don't live there. Yeah. I, and even then, I mean, there are people that, that literally will live on the other side of eight mile. They will be right across the border of Detroit and they may not have been back downtown since Hudson's closed back in the early eighties. You know, it's, it's a really weird thing when they, the, I, the memories that they have are just of like their grandparents going shopping on, on Woodward versus the fact that you can literally go and walk walk into a John Vivardos, an Under Armour, a Nike, a Moose Jaw, all within three blocks of each other. Like, you can drop 10 grand on a coat and then go see a show at the shelter. Like, it's it's a weird dichotomy that's going on right now, and it's, uh, and it's something that even Metro Detroiters don't really think about because they still see it the same exact way that they saw it in, like, the 80s and 90s when you really didn't want to get caught dead downtown. Right. You know, I, I think, you know, one of the things, too, I think every every major state's always going to have mass, you know, it, its areas. You know, I, I live um, above downtown Cincinnati for the better part of a year and, like, lived in not, not a good area, but could drive three streets over and it was super nice. So it's, I think it's just that, that stigma of, you know, people think the things they see in movies and eight miles, the entire city. And it's just, it's, yeah, it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. World-class restaurants. Like, oh, yeah. for serious, anybody that's listening right now, if you are within driving distance of Detroit and you haven't ever thought of it, um, some of the best restaurant tours in the world have started setting up shop for things like ramen and udon and crazy burgers and weird barbecue and everything under the sun. Like, the food here is getting legit. Oh, yeah. And I can definitely speak to not like... Uh, like the Detroit, Metro Detroit area, um, I, I guess it might be farther than Metro Detroit, but um, Warren and uh, Sterling Heights uh, in that farther Metro Detroit area, again, like to that point of like ramen and udon, like have some of the most amazing shops and having now living in a in a small town in a different state that's not as cultured, I can tell you that one of the biggest things I miss is the food. Oh, the diversity of the food is insane. Um, speaking to your point, yeah, uh, Madison Heights, Sterling Heights, Warren area, you've got uh, an insane amount of Vietnamese food, Mediterranean, you go to Southwest Detroit and you've got some of the best taco trucks I've ever possibly seen. Uh, you've got Hamtramck for Polish food, you've got Dearborn, which Dearborn, the, the shawarma restaurant, the, the, the Middle Eastern food, the, the Lebanese food, it's Actually, I'm. I haven't had dinner yet. Either have I. <laughs> You're getting, I'm getting myself I'm hungry. hungry. <laughs> this was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just speaking to the point. I just I, I really want to you know, take a time to kind of showcase the idea of Detroit as somebody that's been born and bred here that that really has never dreamed of of leaving and hopefully never will. Yeah, and uh, I definitely, like, it's, obviously, I, I still have lots of family in Michigan. I, I look forward to every trip back, um, just being able to, like, get, you know, see the food and, you know, getting that kind of the atmosphere, you know, being able to go to stuff downtown. Uh, there's some of, like, so I think some, too, some of the uh, best, like, smaller venues to go to shows at are, you know, downtown. Um, the Fillmore is an amazing place uh, oh, yeah. to go to a rock show. Just so, it's 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 cheaper, um, bigger bands still go there. Uh it's so it's like if you ever there's a like if you ever like ever want to try to like do like a VIP thing that's probably one of the uh, better experiences I've had at the Fillmore. I was able to meet one of my all time favorite bands, See There, um, at the Fillmore, and it was it was only a hundred bucks to to get the VIP ticket and meet them before the show. 
and it's just gonna and it's because it's a smaller venue and, and it's just, yeah to your point it's just there's just so much down there um so when when could like everyone expect um so that's ww so for everyone i'll say it again that's uh, www.detroitetc.com is the website uh when should everyone expect to be able to like go to that website and kind of like see some of the uh, stuff you've been talking about. So I'm going to have the first couple of pages ready to go ahead and launch and, and hit the ground running by the time this episode hopefully hits the uh, the, the world wide web. So <laughs> probably within the next like seven to ten days, I should have the the first couple of things going live on the site. the The main thing that I am that I'm battling right now is that I could I could hit publish on the page right now and be ready to go. But my goal once I actually have the page up and running is to have a feature every other day. And that feature can be an artist, it can be a musician, it can be a building, it can be a street, it can be something that has to do within the the orbit of Detroit. Um, and my goal is to have enough material backlog that I don't have to worry too much with our lockdown, um, because it's a little hard still going out unnecessarily. It's a little nerve wracking trying to go climb around places and, and leave the house because unfortunately I, I am an immune com- compromised individual, not yay Crohn's disease. Mm. Um, but I, I, I'm trying to hold off on it and publish until middle of the month so I at least have enough backlog material to be good. When, when you do uh, are getting ready to publish it, definitely make sure to let me know so I can uh, post about it and kind of. You'll, you'll be the per- first person I send the link to. Awesome. I'll make sure to make sure to drive everyone out there. But everyone so far, if you're listening to this and it's not live yet, definitely save it and, you know, favorite to your bookmarks if people still do that. I don't know if that's still a thing. Um, you know, I'm making myself sound really old asking if bookmarks are still a thing. But, uh, but definitely make sure. Is this part sure. of the video where we go, oh, is it hit, hit, the, hit the button, launch, smash? There's, there's all, the, all, the, <laughs> yeah. all the YouTube phrases. You know, uh, pl- uh, you know, turn it off and on, you know, I don't know. Hit, <laughs> hit the refresh thing, hit that little button and see if that, see if that fixes the, uh, fixes the issue for you. Um, Can you turn the station to three and, uh, make sure your RF adapter is plugged in? Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, the, the good old days. <laughs> There's some people right now that are going, turn the station to three, what? Like, what are you talk? what's the, what do you mean, it's- Three station three is the the news. What are you talking about? <laughs> We're dating ourselves right now. Yeah, I know. Or uh, make sure make sure the uh, the yellow and uh, white cord are in the correct correct one, so you can actually see what game you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. the cheat codes down on the uh the, the game the game directions that it came with it so you can oh, know yeah, what cheats yeah. enter later oh that there's a flashback to the, yeah when that, back when games still came with instruction manuals yeah that's what i had to do for uh final the final fantasy 7 the original final fantasy 7 because i never wanted to miss out on getting vincent so i, I wrote down the code to his uh coffin on, <laughs> uh, on, the, on, the, on the pamphlet that it came with so whenever i got to that part i could just enter it really quick See, I, uh, I, my big memory with a with a Nintendo thing is calling the one eight hundred number on the back for tips and tricks to beat a game. Jeez. <laughs> oh, and I remember I was like seven or eight, and I think I called like five or six times to try and beat Super Mario Two. And I just thought, all right, well, I'm calling the eight hundred number. It's all cool, like no big deal. And then the phone bill came. Yeah. Oh man. Oof. I, I, that that was a weird grounding. Yeah, that's a, yeah. You're like, I don't understand what I did wrong. <laughs> I just talked to someone in video game. Why am I in trouble? <laughs> I think people don't realize like uh, games today. There was no. It wasn't like you booted up a game today where it says like easy. Like just as okay, here's a good reference point. So I just bought Streets of Rage four yesterday. And nice. Playing that uh, through with Mark right now. So uh, we're playing uh, one for fun, and then something that I'm not going to mention because I'm going to tease you guys for. For later, something that I'm working on. We we, we bought it because we, we had played the original Streets of Rage. And one thing I'll, I'll say is, like, when you boot it up, the game says, like, oh, do you want easy, medium, hard, or expert? I'm like, that's not a thing. Like, that wasn't a thing back when the first Streets of Rage came out. It was just game started. Hope you figure it out. Best of luck. You just drop in and you just have to start punching things. 
yeah, it, and now it's like when you when you finish a stage and you die, you can just go back to that stage. It was no, when you die in Future Age, you went back to the very first stage. So you could be on the last level, die, and then you, congratulations, get back to the beginning. Hope you can finish it this time. That's a that's a level of a disappointment that I that I'm glad that I don't have to experience in most video games anymore. Oh, it's some of the strat. Like I I I think I uh, episode one of uh, uh, the guest that I had at the time we had got into it. Um, we had talked about it, just the differences in kind of games today. And one of the big things we had talked about it was the, I don't know, did you ever play any of the games on the Sega Genesis? The the hand, the system, not the handheld? Well, I guess both. But... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, actually, the, uh, the Genesis was my uh, my first 16-bit system. Okay, there you go. Uh, okay, so did you ever play the, ori- the original Lion King? Or do you know what I'm re- about to reference? Oh, the, the PTSD episode yes. that is playing that game? <laughs> Yes, God, that game. And um, the other one I had mentioned too uh, was uh, it was X Men Clone Clone Wars Two, uh, which was a, a more obscure one, but very similar in the style of the the PTSD that the game has caused me is drastic because it was again it's the very same game in terms of you could pick your mutant. That that game was what led to Gambit being my uh, favorite super uh, superhero because you could play him in the game. But it was nice. it was the same thing. You would go through all these crazy plat it was like a it was I can't say it was just a side scroller because you did go up and down so it was more of a multi level side scroller. Mm. Um but it was the very same thing. If you died at any point in the game it sent you back to the very first level, the very beginning of it. And the game also didn't... There was no tutorial. It was just... You dropped in as your hero at the very first like, level. did you start an Asteroid M? Like, didn't it just, like, drop you in the middle of Magneto's base and say, here you go, have fun? It was, like, some weird snowy level, and, like, you, you just dropped in with someone shooting art at you. So you would drop in, a thing would start shooting at you, and it was just, go, kill it. And you're just like, how? What, what button? Game? I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. Sorry. That's not how this game works. Best of luck to you. And like it, it was it, the game. It was so many hours because the whole point is you have to you had to play the game up until there was like there was sixteen levels. So you had to beat like sixteen levels, and you couldn't die. Uh, you had three lives. You couldn't lose all three in sixteen levels. And the whole thing was you had to get to level eight, and then you could play as Magneto. And apparently, you could beat the rest of the game with him. But I I never beat it. Like I got I think the farthest I ever got was like level eleven. And and and, and for reference, people get mad at Dark Souls. Oh yeah. Like, oh I'm, oh, I'm so sorry that you get a chance to reboot and try again. <laughs> oh, man. Like, it's back in those days, it was, it was a weird era in video games where you, you couldn't quite save anything yet. Like, there there was no, like, save button. You had to hope you had to hope you can get through every game that you're playing with, like, two or three lives, like, the sparing of them around, like, the levels. It's And it's a cool form of nostalgia because a lot of those games still hold up. Oh, like, yeah. Let's be, let's be for real. Like, there are, like, I will still boot up uh, you know, my Raspberry Pi with a with a bunch of retro ROMs with, you know, Super Mario Brothers, you know, the old school Super Nintendo one. Like I will I will play as Yoshi old school like all day long. Oh, easily. And I even though it still causes me flashbacks, I will still play uh, X Men Clone Wars on a re a Sega Genesis that I rebought for the purpose of replaying that game. <laughs> Cause it's still fun. Like it's aggravating as all hell, but it's still fun. So, so is that the definition of sadomasochism? I think so, for the video game version, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just lean hard into it. Just go with it. I, I think to your point, like, uh, to your point on save points, I, I think the only game I can think about that even had, like, a save feature back then was Mike Tyson's Punch-Out that gave you the code after you cleared each boss that you could re-enter the code and go back to that boss. Oh, yeah. And you just have a notebook that would sit next to the Nintendo just, like, with all these random codes scribbled in that you would have to try and remember which one went to what game. Because you would never have the forethought to actually write down, this is the boss for Mike Tyson. Oh, yeah. No, you just were like, uh, what's that one for? (laughs) Uh, I'll I'll figure it out. And uh, rest in peace, because he he did pass away, but the the creator of the Konami code, which is still probably the, the most symbolic, I mean, probably video game cheat code in history. Oh, yeah. And that one's just kind of never going to leave the culture. Oh yeah, and uh, there's so much that like, yeah. the, that code brought to. I mean, it's it's used in in, in modern games today. Which uh, I try to play some games. I don't really have a lot of time right now. But there's a certain game, a few games that I want to get right now. And you would kind of mention you're glad you don't have to go through like the uh, crazy stuff that we do growing up. So what like what kind of games are you playing right now? Uh, I I am utterly obsessed with Red Dead Redemption Two still. Um, 
it's that sucks up a lot of my time. Um, I'm playing a lot of Destiny 2 still, which is I I don't know if I have a little bit of a sadomasochistic streak myself. <laughs> if I still trust Bungie to do something at some point. That's, oh, you that's do, going yeah. to, but It's the definition of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that fits my personality type. But I, I have been uh, bit by the MMO bug lately. Like, I am itching to find something massive in multiplayer that I can fall back into. And, like, all signs are starting to point back to just renewing my World of Warcraft subscription. But I'm trying not to... Trying not to get that money to Blizzard if I can avoid it. I uh, I just quit two weeks ago. Wow, wow, classic. Nice. Uh, how are your withdrawal symptoms? It, it it sucked. It sucked some nights because like I, I do miss raiding, and that was because I I played WoW like back when it first came out, uh, but never like that much. It was always like I'd play for ten or fifteen levels and then get bored and quit playing. So this is the first time I got a mage to sixty and actually raided, and it was super fun. Um, but then it got to the point where I was like. As fun as raiding is, if you're not in a guild that knows what they're doing, and you know that just going into it, all right, I'm going to start these raids, and these guys are good, but they don't really know what they're doing, so it, you know, you could it could take like four and a half hours to finish. And it was just the time, I was like, I can't, I can't dedicate four hours to guys who don't know what they're doing. Yeah, it's... and and the effort that it takes to, to find a good guild on WoW, uh, I mean, I, I played a little bit of Classic before I quit the last time. And, and it was cool when the population of the server was dead set massive, but I, I can imagine now that the, uh, the hub of has died down, finding a, a crew that knows what they're doing, that has the time to dedicate to everything, to actually get some of the end game content, like, that, that's, a, that's a bit of a headache. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that's stopping me from wanting to go back to WoW, but then I look at all the other stuff that's out there and it's like, there's not really, there's yeah. not really much new. I'll, like, I'll... I'll probably just get my fix by going back to RuneScape because I still like I still love playing the old school because they <laughs> they brought back the old school 2007 version. Um, That's awesome. I still love playing the original one on that. Uh, and I think it depends on too what you want to do in WoW. Like I, I wasn't I didn't play on a PvP server. I played on PVE. Yeah. Um. So I was in um the guild I was in was pretty good. we we were top 25 in the server. Nice. And then uh, I did. I did pugs with a, a friend of mine who he's he was the one who got me into playing WoW Classic. He's a guy that I work with. He was you know the classic guys. WoW Classic is coming out. Let's all get it and play together. And then one guy dropped out at thirty. I kept going, and now he's got like three sixties and plays like five nights a week and stopped playing. <laughs> um, but the guild he's in is number two in the server. Nice. And I did pugs with them. So. It's kind of like you said, like finding the right guild was is tough, and I guess in that aspect, I lucked out. I was in the two guilds that I ever did any end game content with were top twenty five in the server, so I I played with people that knew what they were doing. I, there's always like we talk about drama at cosplay conventions, and the drama in guilds between <laughs> a first team and a second team, and that that's one of the big reasons I quit because. Uh, you you were in the WoW Classic uses most guilds use a system for called DKP and that's where you earn points when you do raids and then you use those uh, points on the items that drop. I got sixty really late, just with a, with a two year old. I I could only play like an hour and a half certain night, so it took me a long time to get to sixty. So when I got time to sixty, the first team of the guild I was in, they had their their system down pat. You know, they're forty people. They knew exactly how fast they could clear it, and I was able to crack into it once. But they're you know, like I said lots of drama. The guild leader had his friends, so I would sign up before any other mage. As I'd be I'd be the first mage on the first team to sign up, and then five other mages would sign up. It would get to raid day. I'd be like looking for invite and I'd get a reply. Oh, we're all full. They wouldn't go by who signed up when. They would go by what people they wanted to, to run it with. Yeah. And the second raid team was their alts that were 60 and then mixed in with another guild. But that was the one that took four, four plus hours to finish. So it's it's not only finding the right guild, but it's finding a guild that can, will let you be on first team. Yeah, and and I mean, I, I understand the concept of, oh, you got to be here. Like, you, you, everybody has to kind of earn the respect, whatever the case may be. You know, oh, yeah. I, I get that. But but don't sit there and, and stick somebody on, on team two for absolutely ever, for whatever reason. Like, there, there needs to be a little bit of equity. There needs to be some understanding that everybody's trying to, to get the same content. And if, if a guild's not fulfilling, like, that side of things, then that's, that's when you got to walk away. Oh, yeah. Which, which makes sense. Yeah, and maybe I might go back to it one day, uh, you know, and 
because there was I wanted to play like a rogue and try like try other people out and play a warrior and see how that was because playing a mage was fun but you're super squishy. Um, most monsters can kill you relatively easily even at sixty uh, and good gear. So definitely be wary of that if you're thinking of getting into WoW Classic. Mages are super fun and you can make the most money, but you're also going to probably die the most. Um, if you want to hang out and be antisocial, I, I'm all about the hunter. Ooh, okay. I I like I I like hunter. Hunters are pretty good. Uh, oddly enough, though, if, I, if I'm if i going to give, like, an MMO recommendation, I'm actually going to go Knights of the Old Republic at the, the MMO. Nah, you know what? That's one I haven't revisited in a while. So, I don't know what it's like now, but I did play it when it first came out. But in terms of if you want to, if you're kind of thinking of MMOs, but you miss, like, that first player story aspect that, you know, playing some games gets you, that game is a really good mix because... Yes, it's it's multiplayer and there's guilds and there's raids and there's all that stuff. But the storyline built in is like playing Knights of the Old Republic on the uh, on the Xbox or on Steam. Which um, can we all just say that's that's a game they really need to bring something so back? Much. Which can 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 we all just maybe petition something like call somebody? Yeah, I would start that petition because even I would start the petition to just say, look, I don't even care if you give me nothing new, just remaster it. Yeah. Uh, just give me new graphics and release the exact same game and I will pay you 60 bucks. Give us the team that's remastering Final Fantasy 7. Like, can we just have them slide over to a new project? <laughs> I, I haven't gotten it yet. I'm, I really want to. Um, it, I, I, I haven't played it. I, it's it's something that's that's on my list because I still can't get past Red Dead Redemption. Okay, so I, I, I haven't played that, that either, but I have it. It's, once you fall into it, like, Every time I start going to do something, I just realize that I've been doing nothing but hunting and killing for the last, like, 45 <laughs> minutes and making berry pie. And it's just, it's, it, I get fallen into things and it's honestly really relaxed riding your horse around and looking at stuff. And I kind of just do it to relax. And then I realize that it's, I haven't done anything in the game. And <laughs> I have, like, 35 animal pellets in the back of my horse that I've got to sell. It's a good time suck. And I think that's good for the quarantine. <laughs> so similar, similar to Skyrim in that aspect, because that was... That was a game where I, I would always stop playing because I would play it for like a week or two and then realize that I haven't even done the first main mission yet and all I've been doing is side quest. But I definitely still want to play Red Dead because I keep hearing how amazing that game is. Yeah, I just know I just know me. And like you just said, I know once I start playing it, every night when my kid goes to bed, it's going to be like, oh, look at that. I got an hour and a half of Red Dead time. And mm-hmm. that's just all I'm going to do for the like, next oh. hour and a half. I need to go ahead and uh, find myself a couple of pairs that I can get for my perfect custom reward. Let's, let's go ahead and knock this out here. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's 3 a.m. and you've got to be up for work in two hours. Oh, no. Yeah, that's that's yeah. always going to be the trap. And yeah, but um, but yeah, that the reason why, like I said, start, that would be my recommendation for everyone that's listening out there is just because it's it's the storyline built in is like Knights of the Old Republic. It's per character, so it's not like the same storyline. So if you if you pick a bounty hunter or uh, sorry, I only play dark. You know, hashtag go dark side uh, for me. Uh, so if you play like any, the Sith or you know if you play, I guess the light side. So the wrong side, but you know the light side. Um, you could play them too, I guess. Uh, but every hmm. class has its own storyline. So they did a really good job of it's not just one story main game storyline. Every class has their own teacher that you go through a storyline with. So. Uh, definitely very good, but yeah, it's the same price as WoW Classic, but oddly enough that, like, when I get that itch to go back to an MMO, I might, you know, I might try that for a month or two and re-get into that and see how it is, so. You know what? While you were, uh, kind of on your little chat there, I, I popped over to the website for it. It's free to play now. Oh yeah, I forgot. They did do it. So, I do remember that, so I, I'll give you the advice now. So, they did make it free to play. The only thing that they changed, which if you don't care about it, so there's, there's, there's a few skills in Star Wars Star Wars game. It's not as in-depth as WoW Classic, but there is a few. Um, the free-to-play version, all they did was they just removed one. So, like, you can't really do the skills that you would get to be able to do, but, like, if you don't care about that, just go for it. But it's still, yeah, I would, I'd, I might get back into it just to have some fun with it, since it, I forgot it was free-to-play and just not care about skills. Heck, um, I've got it downloading right now. I'm gonna, <laughs> after we're done with this, I might go ahead and throw myself in the for the next, like, six to eight hours. It's, it is really fun. I, I like, Graphic wise, really amazing, um, and then they did a really good job. You you actually get companions in the game that you could have conversations with. So you 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 get can, you get companions as you progress through your own storyline. Oh, so nice. They did a really good job with it. 
Now you're making me probably go like, I could probably download it tonight, probably play it in a couple days. So, <laughs> so great. I probably talked myself into into redownloading again, just just for the sake of like not because I will say that is a stressful part of like playing games like WoW Classic is you, you become so entrenched with like, oh, I got to get this enchantment recipe and. I'm gonna. It's gonna take me like seven hours to grind, but just playing a game like that, knowing like that the free to play version means you can't really do skills that well, and not caring, and just being like, I don't care what gear I get, because I will say it's harder to get gear in Star Wars. But at the end of the day, mm. it, it doesn't matter for your storyline or if you're doing quests. Uh, and and I think that's that's really what I'm what I'm looking for right now is that I I want something with not only the community like the community's part of it. I want to have like the end game with a decent storyline and some some decent atmosphere and all that deal, and I. And I, I thought I was going to get that trying out Star Trek on I did try that too, but yeah. And I, and I realized the storyline's there, but the actual, like, the gameplay aspect of of that whole experience is just a headache. Yeah, it, uh, it wasn't the best. Yeah, unless you're buying stuff, like, you can't really get anything. You end up with the same, like, having the same, like, two or three ships as everybody else. You know, the same skill sets as everybody else. So you end up having getting... Uh, microtransactions today, oh yeah which, uh, which is a free-to-play model that i don't really care i'm i'm all for like i'll pay a monthly subscription give me a free-to-play option i will subscribe if the game's worth it yeah don't microtransaction me to that no please. yeah I, I would try that out when we, when we wrap up here and realize uh, i would i would probably try out star wars then that's it's a good mixture of storyline not you know free to play um, and you still can select some of the really cool classes uh, on the free to play option, and it's. I think there's still a decent amount of people that play it, so there'd be a, still a pretty decent community aspect in it. And they did a really good job, so the worlds look really good. Uh, nice. So it's cool flying around in space and, and doing. You can you can do just space missions where you actually just fly around on your ship and shoot shoot at stuff. So <laughs> it's, it's 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 pretty That's cool. Awesome. Um. So for for everyone kind of who's you know who's listening right now, you guys are. Pretty probably well versed at this point. If it is your, like I said earlier, if it's your first time, uh, what I always do at kind of the end of each episode is I always like to give a, uh, a fandom tip. And if you have been paying attention, you know that I'm still trying to workshop my name because I'm terrible at names. Um, but uh, in a kind of a special treat for you guys, um, our tip this week's actually going to come from our guest. Uh, Darren, and it's called uh, Affinity Photo, and I know you explained it to me earlier, but would you uh, like to give everyone kind of a overview of what that is and why, like, you would want to recommend it to people? So, anybody that's familiar with anything in the creative world, like, we all know Adobe is game. Uh, Photoshop, Lightroom, like, these are the standards. Like, the term Photoshop is, is there for, for a reason. But it's expensive. Um, you can be paying 10 15 up to $70 a month for all the different suites of software. And that's a month, like, and that's that's something that adds up over time. So it can make getting into something like that really daunting. Affinity is a super powerful Photoshop facsimile. It does ninety nine point nine percent of what Photoshop and Lightroom can do. The tools are a little different, but the majority of it, if you're familiar, it transfers over. But it's a one-time purchase. They have it available on the Mac Store for twenty-five bucks. Um, I personally really love using the iPad with the Apple Pencil, uh, just because I am that bougie dude that now <laughs> has everything Apple. Oh God, I am uh, that person. Yeah. Um, but but for real, it's it's a fantastic application. It's a one-time purchase. It's relatively cheap. It's twenty-five bucks, I think, at the most expensive. And there's tons of tools, tons of plugins, and my favorite thing out of it is the YouTube community for it is amazing. So if you don't know how to do something, like, there's a video, and it'll walk you straight through it. And the process for it is very similar to Lightroom, Photoshop, so those skills can transfer over if you reach a point where you outgrow the software. So it's a, it's a nice little thing to kind of get yourself involved without breaking the bank or committing to something that if you don't use it for a month, is bad about it. Okay. And uh, so for, for everyone uh, listening right now, I will make sure uh, when this is launched, in addition to the, the links I had mentioned previously, I will uh, make sure I post the link to uh, where you guys can purchase Affinity Photo. Uh, if you're, you know, the, the bougie Mac person, or I, I guess you can get it if you're not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a, it's a cool song. Like I said, check it out. It's fun. It's easy. Yeah, and, for, cool and for the price that you mentioned, um, definitely if those of you that are trying to get into that kind of area for the price that was mentioned, you know, $25 or, uh, you know, if it's, you know, if, if, even anything higher than that is definitely, you know, if the uh, Adobe creative suites, which 
I currently pay for it. Yeah, like it's it's not cheap. Um, so for something like that, definitely, uh, I recommend. I would recommend as well. Definitely for you guys, check that out. Link will uh, will of course uh, be posted, like mentioned. Uh, and then uh, just to make sure we reiterate this uh, for yourself, uh, Darren. So it's the so it's obviously Instagram.com. I'm sure you guys are more than familiar with what goes to the beginning of a web address. I would hope. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's <laughs> slash Darren James Photography. And then the uh, website that'll be up pretty soon is the www.detroitetc.com. So definitely make sure you guys go to both of those things, especially if you're a Midwest cosplayer and live in the city. I don't see why you wouldn't go to either of those things unless you're just a terrible person. So there you go. Now I've made you feel guilty and you'll have no choice but to go to those things. Otherwise, you'll just have to admit you're a bad person. So uh, no, but (laughs) I know you guys are going to definitely be awesome about it. And I love the guilt angle. You got to go with it, though. I mean, it can't hurt. You know, like <laughs> if you've made it this far, like you're gonna, you the guilt's to gonna work in. Yeah, you're, you're with us now. Yeah, you're pretty much you're sucked in at this point. So just you know, do what we tell you to do. Take the red pill. Everything will be fine. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, but of course, uh, like uh, Dan, this is probably one of my favorite uh, episodes to record so far. And uh, this is this has been a pleasure. Yeah, you were you were awesome. That's uh, definitely that. You know, make sure you guys. You know, you you guys always do a great job of supporting everything that I do and that we do on the page. So of course, you guys know that I wouldn't have a guest on and I wouldn't push something if I didn't think that there was value in it for you guys or uh, entertainment uh, in it for you guys as well. So uh, definitely appreciate everyone out there uh, listening to episode five of the Phantom Effect. Uh, keep it up. You guys are amazing. Uh, of course, make sure the usual follow at the uh, the SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. Uh, the YouTube is now uh, more up and running. Got Apple to switch over a couple of the uh, logo changes, which was a huge pain in the ass. And of mm. course, uh, Google. I'm working on Google Play Podcasts right now. It's a little different, uh, but that should be up pretty soon as well for you guys. So definitely make sure you guys check everything out. Follow uh, Darren's Instagram. Make sure you do the old school thing of bookmarking that website when it comes out. And I will see you guys next time on episode six. So you guys have a good day. Have a good night. Thank you everyone for listening to the fandom effect. Please make sure to follow me on all available platforms, Facebook, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. And if you or yourself or knows anyone that's perhaps interested in being a guest on the fandom effect, please feel free to let me know. And I would love to talk to you guys. So I will see you guys on the very next episode of the fandom effect.